Hey, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Deep Focus Media Podcast. I'm Dr. Jennifer Lyerly, and I am joined today by a guest who, if you're at Continuing Education, you know you're making a beeline to his course. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Mark Dunbar. Hey, everybody. How, how are you all doing? Hi, Jennifer. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I know we're going to learn so much for you today. And we are talking about a topic that I think we all see in our clinical practice, but we probably haven't spent as much time thinking about it as far as how we handle it as doctors, because in the past, there really wasn't anything that we could do. And sometimes when you don't have a treatment, then it's not occupying quite as much brain space because it's, we see it, but besides diagnosing, then the conversation's over. So geographic atrophy, we have such exciting new news and breakthroughs within our, our science and our clinical ability, but now we need to focus on better diagnosing and detecting it. So we're going to start at the ground floor on today's podcast. And I'd like to say this activity is sponsored by Iveric Bio and Estella's company, but Iveric Bio had no input in the development of this content. This is an independent podcast. Dr. Dumber, let's kick it off by giving a little intro about you. Can you share your practice and, and how you got to be this guru in the retinal space? Sure. sure. Um, certainly not a guru, but I do have a strong interest in retina. I practice at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, which is part of the University of Miami's uh, Department of Ophthalmology. Um, I have been there for over 35 years. Um, I came down via... Uh, Gosh, mid 80s, late 80s. Uh, I don't know if many of you remember the Omni Eye Services. I was a, a resident with Hal Finley at the Omni in Lexington. And, and uh, this was really kind of the beginning of co management, if you will. And, and my mentors, like Howell, like Paula Jamie, and those guys, they had all trained at Baskin Palmer. So I had a chance to go down there and, and uh, thought I was going to, you know, spend a couple of years at Baskin Palmer and leave. And, you know, you blink your eye and 35 years goes by and I'm, I'm still there. Um, I spent many of my early years working in the retina clinic um, with, you know, some of the greats, uh, giants in the retina field. And so I obviously had an interest in retina. I started doing the retina quiz. I did that for in review of optometry for well over 20 years. I just kind of gave that up to one of our uh, younger ODs on our staff. So uh, even though I'm known as a retina person, I, I really do kind of primary eye care. You know, I see a lot of glaucoma. I see a lot of patients with diabetes. I, uh, a lot of cataracts. I think it's very typical of a of an optometric practice. Uh, I even over the last few years have fit a few contact lenses, which is surprising because I really know nothing about contacts and haven't fit lenses in over twenty years. So, uh, so that's kind of fun and interesting and exciting. But yeah, I, my passion is is retina, no question about it. You know, we have a lot of young doctors, a lot of student doctors who listen to the show, and any advice that you have for someone listening about how to get into more of this retinal or medical care and optometry? Because I think sometimes that path isn't as clear. No, it isn't. You know, and I think with today's technology like OCT, uh, you know, devices, um, I think, you know, practicing medical, writing prescriptions, making sure you're keeping patients in your chair when appropriate, um, you know, instead of referring every case that, again, just even a dry macular degeneration, I mean, that is tailor-made for optometry. Remember, most of these patients won't convert, won't need uh, to be referred. And so those are patients that we can, you know, see in our practices. Same thing with glaucoma, right? Um, early, moderate cases of glaucoma should be managed in, in the optometric community. And then, you know, I think if you have a chance to, to write case reports and things like that, we've got some great journals with review of optometry, optometric management, modern optometry. I think, um, you know, having a voice, sharing cases, you know, those type of things. And then even within the pharma community, you know, when you start writing prescriptions and you're recognized as being medical, you get a chance to, you know, do some of the dinner programs because the pharma co community, if, if you're not writing, um, you know, I, I hear all the time, well, I, I haven't seen my pharma rep in, in forever. And it's because, you know, you're, you're not practicing medical optometry. They're not going to waste their time with somebody who's not writing prescriptions. So that's treating dry eye. That's managing glaucoma and things like that. So I think it's a, a collective effort of just, you know, having this interest, wanting to make a difference, not only in, in your patients' lives, but I, you know, I think in the profession as well. You know, when we choose residents, one of the questions I always ask myself is, is this somebody that can help change the profession? And, uh, wow, that's a great I, I know question. The, I know the people, you know, that were my mentors that inspired me. They were people that, you know, had an interest to, to change, help change the profession. And not that you are going to do that, but but I think you want the, the best interest of the profession. We want to move it forward. And, and I think, you know, the younger generation is the same way. 
well, I, anybody who gets your residency program, we get, give a big pat on back because you have been dubbed a person who can change optometry. So that is incredible. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things, obviously, that you mentioned in doing a, a full spectrum of primary care is that as a part of that, yes, glaucoma is part of your practice. Yes, macular degeneration is part of your practice. And when we think about our average macular degeneration patient, of course, the patients with wet AMD come to mind as a screen, but when you look at this prevalence data, only about 200,000 Americans per year get diagnosed with wet macular degeneration. So of the forms of macular degeneration, this is a smaller subset. Most of our patients are dry and are going to remain dry. Correct. And when I read this stat, I was a little bit surprised because it sneaks up on you. Studies show a million Americans have geographic atrophy but that's probably incredibly underdiagnosed because we haven't been very good at detecting early forms of it. How much geographic atrophy do you feel like you see in your practice? Well, you know, prior to, you know, the approval of both of the new drugs, I, I would say not much, right? I mean, just because to your point, we really haven't been looking for it. You know, when we think of geographic atrophy, we conjure in our mind the, the patient who's got, you know, a central discoform scar or you know, we've all watched helplessly as the patient has this kind of donut shaped area of GA. And we know it's, you know, it's going to, it's going to involve the fovea at some point in time. So we've, that's, that's kind of in our mindset when we think of GA, but the fact is it's, that's, that is it certainly, but I think the vast majority are, you know, are, are patients who have it that we're, we're not looking for it because mm -hmm. again, when you code macular degeneration, there's this obviously dry or wet. And when we come to dry, it's, you know, is it early? Is it intermediate? When you look at a code for geographic atrophy, the, the, the ICD-10 code is central foveal involving geographic atrophy. So when we've been coding macular degeneration, we just have it, you know, we've coded it as, as dry. And, and you know, one, one stat that, that came out of the age-related eye disease study, when they looked at, you know, from intermediate level AMD, the 10-year risk of developing vision loss. And and I think we wouldn't be surprised that the 10-year risk of going on to develop wet macular degeneration is, is about 50%. I think we wouldn't really have any problem. We would, all right, I, I buy that statistic. But the other statistic, the 10-year incidence of going on to develop geographic atrophy is actually higher. It's over 50%. Uh, and so I remember looking at that statistic and I'm like, there's no way. You know, that's, you know, I thought that's the marketing machine, right? This is, we got companies who have drugs now and they want us to, certainly they want us to be aware of geographic atrophy, but but is it is it more common than, than wet AMD? And the fact is, you know, this, the age-related eye disease study was on intermediate AMD, right? Looking at is there nutritional supplements make a difference? So, so this is a well-designed, so this was any form of geographic atrophy. So even small little patches of GA, certainly extrafoveal GA or parafoveal GA. So, so they were, you know, patients had imaging done, they had photos and there was a reading center. So, so again, we're not talking about the central discoform lesions. We're talking about really any form. And so when you think of it as being over 50%, that's becomes pretty significant. So to your point, Jen, I mean, we, we just haven't been looking for it. You know, we don't recognize that our our focus, and rightfully so, right, is we've been following these intermediate level AMDs or any AMDs, and, you know, we see them, we do OCTs, and the question is, have they converted to wet? Do I see fluid? Is there, is there elevation? Is there crotally vascular membrane? The question hasn't been, does this patient have GA? You know, I, I, I haven't been looking for it. And so it's been interesting over the last six or eight or nine months since, you know, it's been on our radar, I recognize, gosh, I've seen way more cases of GA than I ever thought possible. You're, I loved your point earlier about there's not even a code for a peripheral, non-central right. geographic lesion. So th if that tells you anything about how the mindset's been, um, it, we can't even really document it in our, in our right. uh, plan. So, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking for it. And we're going to dive in on how you're right. detecting it in your practice so you can teach us all of your tips and tricks here in a, sure. a, a few minutes. I wanted to talk one other thing about, I feel like this is maybe the biggest future uh, for optometry that's really here upon us. America is aging and optometry is 
by absolute necessity going to be called to care more for our elderly population. There are just not enough ophthalmologists to care for all of the aging population needs. So that means glaucoma, that means cataracts, that means macular degeneration. It will be in your chair more than ever as these patients need advanced eye care. And so um, by 2030, one in five Americans will be 65 or older. Geographic atrophy is very strongly age-related. Um, when you look at studies, one in 29 people over the age of 75 years old have geographic atrophy. One in four people over the age of 90 have geographic atrophy. So as our patients are living longer and we as optometrists are seeing older and older Americans, we are going to see this at really high levels. So it becomes essential that we're good at detecting it and then treating it now that that's an option. Yeah, I mean, your numbers are right on. Uh, my number, you know, I think over the age of 70, AMD affects one in three, right? And so uh, so that's pretty significant. And to your point, we're looking at an aging population. Uh, one of the statistics I throw around, think about this, every day, 10,000 people a day turn 65. And so as we've got this aging population living longer, you know, this is being recorded in the morning and I'm you know, at, a, at a meeting in Indiana. I was watching the Today Show and they do this smuckers over a hundred. And, and literally there were 10 people that they just talked about. Some were 105. You know, there was one or two that was 110, right? And so it's like unbelievable. So yeah, patients are living longer and you look particularly at GA. Um, you know, we see AMD 65, 70, 75, right? But GA more commonly in that over 80, 85. In fact, you know, I think 20% of GA occurs in people in that 90 year range. So so those are the ones, you know, we're going to see it in the early groups as well. And, and again, we're recognizing and following patients with AMD. But yeah, it's 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 certainly more of the elderly population. And 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 to your point, you know, it, it is it takes a village to raise a patient, an elderly patient, when you look at all the other potential, you know, diseases, as you indicated, glaucoma, macular degeneration, cataracts, patients with diabetes. And and again, optometry, you know, we're we're, we're on the front lines of these diseases. And I tell you, I, I applaud, you know, the companies like Iveric and Apellis and, and even the, the wet AMD companies like Regeneron and, and Genentech, right? Because they are paying attention to optometry. They're doing education centered around AMD and diabetes. And, and again, you and I may never decide which drug a patient gets. We're probably not going to be the one to put a needle in the eye, but, but we are the ones that are going to diagnose it and make sure those patients get sent to a retinal specialist at the appropriate time. And so, yeah, it does start with education. It starts with recognizing these diseases. And so, and again, to your point, you look at geographic atrophy, a disease that we haven't been looking for. And now there's a lot of education that, that needs to be done. How do we detect it? How do we recognize it? And shifting our focus away from conversion from dry to wet, uh, man, I need to start looking for geographic atrophy because if we can recognize it earlier and, and get it into the retinal specialist, again, our goal to prevent vision loss. You know, we, we don't want to see these eyes that are 2,200 that have lost central vision. We want to get them earlier and, and really potentially save vision. So let's get into detecting right. these All early right. forms of geographic yeah. atrophy. So we're going to review some biomarkers and how to detect the yeah. earliest stages of disease because yeah. the treatment that's available, you have to intervene early in order to get the long-term benefits. We know genetics plays a role in macular degeneration, right. especially that CFH and ARMS2 alleles. Yep. Do you do genetic testing for your patients or recommend genetic testing? I I, I do not. Um, and, and again, you know, the American Academy of Ophthalmology has come out against uh, doing genetic testing. Remember, Arctic, I think Arctic DX was a Canadian company that I think were pioneers in 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 um, in, in genetic testing. And, and kind of the idea was if you could kind of recognize people who had these, you know, high risk genetic markers, you know, those would be the ones that perhaps we would follow more closely. We would recommend nutritional supplements for. And, and the problem is, you know, the data was was kind of flawed on, on does that make a difference? Does it make a difference on which genetic supplement you 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 take? And, and again, just recognizing that that AMD is is complicated. It's not only about genetics, it's about environmental factors, it's it's about you know oxidative stress and it's really this you know, this compilation of all these variables that predispose a patient to developing AND. And so, and, and so the point was we don't have a treatment and we're not going to do anything any different to these patients anyway, other than, you know, recommend, you know, 
not smoking, green leafy vegetables. So a diet that's rich in green leafy vegetables, you know, high fish intake. And so whether you're, you know, have a genetic marker or not, um, you know, we're going to make those recommendations to our elderly patients anyway. And, and remember, for people who don't have any AMD, even early AMD, uh, it, it, the, the age-related eye disease study showed it didn't make any difference of taking a nutritional supplement. So, so, so you know, it's 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 difficult, right? Do you, do you recommend it or not? Because here's here's the other side of the coin that that I struggle with. So we all have patients who've who've you know, 23 and me, they've taken. I was going to mention that. I know I have so many patients coming that say, I have the genetic risk. Exactly. I have the genetic risk. I want to know, do I have macular degeneration? What do I do? You know, and, and of course you do an eye exam. They don't have any, any AMD. They don't have any drusen. Um, and, and what do you do? We don't really have any data to guide us. So do you recommend a nutritional supplement for somebody who may have the genetic profile, but doesn't have AMD? And so you know, how do you, how do you make that decision? So I think we educate them, right? Um, coming in at least once a year to get your eyes tested. You talk about nutritional supplements. And and again, I think to some degree, you, you, you put it back on them that, you know, the age-related eye disease study showed that people who didn't have AMD, there wasn't any benefit, but they didn't study people who had this genetic risk. And so, you know, it won't hurt you to take it. Um, there's maybe an economic disincentive because they're not cheap. And, you know, so I, I just think providing information and, and hopefully as time goes on, we'll get more information on how to guide these patients. Um, you know, I let people know, you know, I had another instance where a patient came in, my father, he was a 50 year old, mid 50 year old guy who, listen, my father lost central vision from macular degeneration. He had injections. You know, I'm worried, what do I do? Um, and so, you know, there's a couple, um, you know, I didn't recommend Arctic DX, but I said there is a, a direct to consumer genetic test available. I'm just blanking out on the name right now. Um, so, you know, if you want to do the genetic testing, you can do it and you can kind of find out, do you have the genetic risk? Otherwise, we're going to see you once a year. We right. recommend the green leafy vegetables, the diet, exercise, those type of things. So, but again, this is an evolving area and, and genetics ain't going away. So I think there's going to be more and more you know, people coming in and probably more companies developing genetic tests. And so I think we're going to be faced with these decisions more and more as time goes on. I approach it very similarly to you where because the ARA study didn't find a benefit, I don't recommend it specifically for patients who don't have or macular degeneration or even have the early stages. It was for intermediate dry macular degeneration that they found the benefit. Right. But I'll tell them, you know, obviously diet, lifestyle, don't smoke, green leafy vegetables, make sure you have good cardiovascular health, exercise. If you're a person who takes a vitamin anyway, yeah. absolutely. The, having a vitamin with lutein in it is not going to hurt you in any way. Lutein is not dangerous to your body. So uh, each person will make their own decision about how they feel about vitamins. All we can do is present the information. That's exactly right. So our, our best detection um, for macular, or excuse me, mac, well, for macular degeneration too, but for geographic atrophy especially, is going to be with imaging. Especially early macular degeneration changes can be is really hard to see with undilated 90 or even 90, or excuse me, even dilated eye exams. And when you have that imaging and you can use some of these different filters, it can really come to life, especially... Um, with red-free filters or fundus autofluorescence or OCT. So let's kind of go through how you go about imaging your patients who are macular degeneration patients or you feel like might be at risk. Yeah. You know, so we rely heavily on, on OCT imaging. And, and the problem is OCT is very good. And, and most ODs now have OCT in their practice. So I think whether you're going to use um, the on-FOS image or, or the near IR image on your OCT, each device is a little bit different. You know, you can, you know, it may highlight geographic atrophy a, a little bit better. You know, looking, <coughs> excuse me, I'm kind of battling a cold here that we've got four hours of lecture later today. So I don't, we'll see, oh, how, <laughs> see how I survive. <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, looking at the B-scan, you know, images, do you see, you know, little hypertransmission defects? And again, not just the central B scan image, but but looking at all the different roster lines. So, um, and and again, I, I think learning how to do that, recognizing what we call these biomarkers. So again, this remember we've been looking for fluid elevation is a crotally vascular membrane, right? But 
you alluded to early, these biomarkers that may be predictive. So there's these things called hyperreflective foci, little anterior, just above the RPE, these little reflective dots, um, or these reticular pseudodrusen, or what we call hyperreflective columns, these little like rays of sunshine that kind of peek through the RPE on, on the B scan. And again, it's hard to talk about these things without seeing them. But the point is, you know, these are biomarkers that when you're looking at a patient with dry AMD that are maybe predictors uh, that put patients at a higher risk that they may go on to develop geographic atrophy. So, so I think, again, as, as we're becoming more and more familiar with AMD, and again, I think taking it to the next level, not just looking for fluid and evidence of coronary vascular membrane, but really looking for these biomarkers that may be predictive. And, and if you do see these biomarkers, then it's, you know, bring this patient back instead of once a year, maybe twice a year and focus on these little areas that may be predictive. Because again, if you see these reticular pseudodrusion, these hyperreflective foci, these, you know, hypertransmission defects or just more elevated or higher drusen volume, all these, I think intuitively we recognize that these are risk factors of, of going on not only to develop GA, of course, but wet AMD. And so the big thing is we see these patients more often. You know, some of the OCTs have 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 programs. I think the Cirrus has this um, sub RP sub 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 RPE sub illumination analysis. So mm -hmm. we can really highlight, you know, that kind of sub RPE layer and and again give you Drusen volume and, do, and does a nice job of highlighting, you know, areas of geographic atrophy or progression analysis. So I think you know there's a lot that we need to do with our OCT to learn how to kind of you know, better detect geographic atrophy because it can be, you know, very sensitive and highly accurate. Now, you know, let's talk a little bit about fundus autofluorescence. And, and that's really been, you know, FAF was really kind of the, the benchmark for, for recognizing or detecting geographic atrophy. And, and in the clinical trials, FAF fundus autofluorescence was really used as, as really the marker for, you know, do these drugs work? Are we slowing down the progression of geographic atrophy? So if you have Fundus autofluorescence, that's probably the best tool, obviously using both in tandem OCT and fundus autofluorescence. And of course, with fundus autofluorescence, you're looking at these hypo reflective areas or patches. Mm -hmm. And again, when, when you look at, you know, dry AMD that have got, you know, they're very, look at the fundus photo and you, you detect, gosh, there's, there's a lot of drus in there. There's so much going on. You know, to your point, these little air patches of GA, you, you may not even see or recognize. So so using fundus autofluorescence, using OCTR, I think are really good tools to be able to pick it up and, and highlight. And, and again, we, we haven't been used to doing it. So I think, you know, we're going to have a, a, a lot of education over the next couple of years around, you know, doing a better job of, of detecting it. And, and so think about most ODs have, you know, wide field, you know, fundus uh, cameras, whether you have the Optos or the, or the Iden or the, or the Claris or others. You know, a lot of them have uh, fundus autofluorescent abilities. So I think breaking it out, making sure you're using it, you know, specifically, you know, looking for geographic atrophy, I think is going to be very helpful. I have been surprised this year. We recently got an ultra wide field imaging system at my yeah. clinic and a large patch of geographic atrophy. I know all of us are going to see, but you will be surprised on your patients that it just looks like speckled drusen. When you run a fundus autofluorescence image on them, the peripheral GA patches that can be very small, you would not be able to see them when traditional fundus imaging. And if it's not central, your OCT is not going to detect them either. So um, really, really incredible what you can see once you start using the fundus autofluorescence filter as well. Well, and, and what's more, you know, I mean, I, I, there's a patient <clears throat> that I that I had been following for, you know, several years, intermediate AMD. I see him twice a year. He, he is like clockwork. He comes in every six months, you know, and, and again, my focus had been on this intermediate, making sure he doesn't progress. And, and this is probably along December, January, I think he comes in and all of a sudden there's you know, a lot of attention around GA and, and a new treatment coming down the pike. And, and as I started looking at his, at his OCTs over the last, you know, year or two, you know, I was able to see he's, he's got geographic atrophy, you know, and, and I hadn't even, you know, and it was, it was, it was paraphobial or almost extra, extra foveal. And, 
and I hadn't even been paying attention. So it was right there in front of me. And I'm like, holy cow, this, this patient has got GA and, and it can potentially, I mean, who knows how, you know, we think of GA growing very slowly, uh, but it's not as slow as we think, you know, in, in some of the studies from being able to drive a car to losing your driver's license was over two and a half years. So, so GA goes a little bit quicker than, than what we probably realize. So, but the point with him is it was there. I hadn't even been really looking for it. Why? Because, you know, there wasn't a treatment. Um, you know, my concern was really this progression from intermediate to wet. And it's like, holy cow. So I ended up ultimately sending him to a retinal specialist and and he ended up moving from South Florida up to South Carolina. So I'm not sure what happened to him, but, uh, but just that's the point, right? We've seen, we have these patients in our practice. We haven't been really paying attention or looking for GA. One other thing that you mentioned earlier was the reticular pseudodrusent. And I, at the beginning of the year, I feel like I had never heard that term yeah. before, but now it's like such a vital part of trying to detect these patients who are at risk of progressing with right. disease. And obviously I encourage everyone Google picture of this if you don't know what I say, but you, when you're looking at your OCT image, you're going to have your Drusen, right, in the RPE. With the Drusen breaks through the RPE and enters into the outer retinal layers, that's a reticular pseudodrusen. And so yeah, that means that patient's RPE. at higher risk. Exactly right. Exactly right. So start yeah, looking for that, guys. Make that well, part of your yeah. vocabulary. Yeah. Well, exactly. You know, and we I just came back from Vision Expo and we just did an OCT lecture and there was a, really a lot of uh, stuff around macular degeneration and GA. So we are really starting to talk about biomarkers and, and uh, you're going to hear about it. And I think, again, I think it's our natural progression of understanding OCT to begin learning, talking about biomarkers and, and begin looking for it. Because again, it's a predictor of progression. And, and that's certainly within the wheelhouse of optometry. We, we need to be doing it. We need to re know the terminology. We need to be looking for it. So let's say we've got a patient now that we've, we've determined they do have GA. Obviously, in the past, it was just like, all right, we'll see you back next year. You have dry. Keep doing all our dry treatments, which is vitamins and lifestyle. Right. But that's not the case anymore. So what is your now referral path for a patient with dry macular degeneration with geographic atrophy? Sure. Well, number one, obviously, you talked about detecting it. You know, is it how close is it to the fovea? Um, mm -hmm. You know, is it well outside? Does it look like it's going to be a threat to vision? And you know, I think these more parafovial lesions recognizing, I think, you know, those are patients that we can probably follow, right? Um, do your imaging, whether it's fundus autofluorescence or OCT, but capture the image. And, and I would bring these patients back twice a year um, and, and repeat imaging. Um, and, and you want to try to get a sense of how rapidly are they progressing? How rapidly is it changing? Extrafovial, um, you know, so maybe closer to the fovea, those are patients I absolutely would send to a retinal specialist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the eyes that have already lost central vision in one eye, those are easy, right? They've got geographic atrophy in the other eye. You know that, you know, it's a threat. Those are the ones that I'm certainly gonna, gonna send to a retinal specialist. Um, but yeah, the, the ones that are more parafovial, you know, in, in, in the clinical trials, those were eyes that were not randomized to treatment, they they were really followed. So anyone that had a threat to vision, and I think we can kind of conjure in our mind really what those eyes are, or you know maybe you're just not comfortable monitoring. They've got GA, and like you know what, I know that this is going to become a problem. Let me just send it to a retinal specialist. I think you know, certainly I think that's fine. But on the other hand, when we look at as we talked about earlier with our tools that we have in our toolbox, and and again the really the burden on the retinal specialist, I would like optometry to follow these non-visual threatening GAs in our practice, just like we follow traditional dry and intermediate A and B in our practice and not refer them until we think that a treatment may be beneficial. Right. Um, and remember once, if they get treated, you know, this is probably an uh, every month treatment, right? right? Um, and, and, and here's the thing about GA, you know, this isn't a cure. We're not curing it. We're not taking a patient who's got diabetic macular edema or AMD who's 20, 80, and they've got fluid in their macula and treating them and, and the edema goes away or the fluid goes away and the patients are like, ah, oh, I see better. I can really see a, a difference, right? We're looking at pay people, hopefully, if we do our jobs, that they still have got good central vision. They're still able to read and drive. And so we're, we're 
subjecting them to a month or every month treatment um, with the hope that they will keep and maintain their vision. So, you know, think about from a patient perspective, how do you, you know, what, what do they get out of it? Right. You know, and, and again, the patients who've got retinal edema, they, they see a benefit in their vision, the AMD with GA who already has good vision, you know, it, it becomes a little bit of a tough sell. And, and I always say, you know, unfortunately they may never see the benefit of this treatment if, if we catch them right and they are able to keep and maintain vision. So and then, you know, part two of that, think of the patient that we're talking about, right? We said it's the 85, 90 year old patient who's got GA, you know, they've, they're elderly, they're, they're maybe not so mobile. They're relying on other people for transportation. They're, you know, they've got other comorbidities. And, and, and again, you know, it's, I, I think this is some of the, the, the social and uh, psychological issues that, that we, as the primary eye care provider are going to have to deal with. We're going to be the cheerleader. We're going to be the educator. We're going to let them know that there is a treatment. And again, the low hanging fruit of the eyes that have already lost central vision in one eye. And you look at the fellow eye and, and they get it too. And, and I had one of those early on in, you know, February, March, she's already lost central vision, starting to lose central vision. And she was signed me up. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm affected. I, there's a treatment, I, I, I'll do it, you know, uh, but, but, but that's not everybody. It, you know, in hearing you describe this treatment, it's very similar to our mindset with glaucoma. We can't cure it. We can't reverse the damage. Right. Um, but in our patients that are at risk of losing vision, we need to preserve and protect those patients. And that's what the treatment for, for GA does. So you have to make that decision on as this person individually at risk of vision loss in their lifetime. And that's the person who needs treatment to preserve and protect that they have. Correct. That's exactly right. Um, and again, you know, you look at the Smuckers uh, Today Show. I mean, these people may live to 100, 105, right? And we want them to enjoy vision for a lifetime to, you know, be able to read the New York times to recognize the face of their grandchildren or great grandchildren or other things. And so, yeah. So yes, it takes a village, right? We all have to get on board. We all have to make sure we catch these patients early and, you know, before they've developed central GA, because those are not the patients we're really looking to treat. Um, well, and you mentioned, so like a person who already has advanced vision loss, yeah. there's, there's not going to be a benefit, unfortunately, with, with this treatment, but that's where, a low vision referral can still be an important okay. part that I think many of us will will often kind of overlook. Finding low vision specialists right now is extremely difficult. And I encourage any doctor listening to this episode, if you have a passion in this area, please pursue low vision because we'd all love to refer to you. But yeah. these patients need care just in a different way. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We're lucky enough. We have the Miami Lighthouse for the Blind uh, and, and we utilize them a lot. And I know there's a lot of lighthouses in larger, um, you know, metropolitan areas, but they, those people who specialize in low vision in maybe more of the rural areas, it becomes harder and harder. So to your point, I think it's very, very important. And, um, and again, you know, the goal is like any disease, we don't want these patients to have to need low vision. We want to catch them before that's the case. But unfortunately we know that that doesn't always happen. So this is our, our job now leaving the show. We all have a to-do list. Yeah. OCT, fund this off for us in imaging, start detecting early so we can hopefully intervene long before central vision loss occurs. Um, you've been sharing so many patient stories, but I'm going to ask, is there any other patient that comes to mind that's made an impact on your life and, and why you practice that has geographic atrophy? Yeah. You know, um, the last one, you know, this is kind of the, the sad story, right? Um, I, I, patient who comes in and this ended up probably the spring, February or March. So we already had an FDA approved treatment. Um, and when she had been seen three years earlier, she was a, you know, elderly Hispanic lady who is very, very active. She walks every day, you know, a grandmother, you know, was, you know, driving very involved in, in, you know, her, her children and her, and her grandchildren's life. And, and, um, and that was three years earlier. And so she comes in and, and she was 20, 40, I want to say, you know, still able to do things that, you know, you can do with 20, 40, right? Still be very active. And so she she came in and, and now she's 2,200 in each eye. And she has mm -hmm. these large, you know, she had them then, but they were foveal sparing. Now they're involving the fovea. And, and it was, you know, just that 
helpless feeling that that um, that we've all faced with our patients, where you feel like you've lost the battle, right? And and um, and it was just like, gosh, if if we you know if we could have just had a treatment earlier and done something, and and I know low vision, you know, we did recommend her going to the lighthouse uh, in in Miami, but it was just you know, the sad, you know, when we see patients that are losing vision and, and loss of independence. And so she became a completely different lady, right? Her daughter who had brought her in, just she's depressed. She's not able to do the things she likes to do. And, and you know, as, as optometrists, we're, we're all too familiar with those, with those cases, with these patients as we've watched, as I said, helplessly. And, um, and it's like, man, if we just if if we if it could have been a year earlier or two earlier, maybe there was you know something we could have offered her, and and it was just you know the sad case. And and I hope again that we don't see these patients in. I mean we will, but but if we can catch them earlier, you know we know they're out there. To your point, we talked about the data in the statistics one and three over you know we're dealing with AMD and what eighteen million people are going to have macular degeneration globally by I think twenty fifty. And so you know you know the numbers, you know they're going to be there, and uh and and so we're all. You know, it takes a village to care for a patient with with macular degeneration. So we all have to do our job. And and I really applaud, you know, Apellus and Iveric, the companies who recognize that, you know, we're in the driver's seat as optometrists. You know, these patients are in our chairs. They get to the retinal specialist through us. And so when you think about optometry doing 85% of all the eye exams, and I, I, it, I think it's great that we have the opportunity to recognize, educate, you know, really help cure blindness from our patients. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Dunbar, for joining us today, sharing your insight, and then also sharing your passion. It really reads through. And I know um, just listening to you today, I'm ready to run some OCTs right now. So, Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for tuning in. As always, if you have any questions about today's episode, you can shoot it over to Defocus Media. We're on all your favorite social media platforms. And we can't wait to see you back again for a future episode. Make sure you tell Daryl I said hi, too, please. Awesome. Take care.